Hello, everybody. You're about to hear my interview with Dr. Thomas Keith, who builds himself and showed up to me as definitely anti-sexist and anti-racist. I was so excited to get him here, and you will see why. At the end of the interview with him, I'll give you my comments. Hope you enjoy it. He has a lot to say that's pretty provocative. Dr. Thomas Keith is an American filmmaker, educator, and anti-sexist activist. He received master's and PhD in philosophy from Claremont Graduate University, professor of philosophy at California State Polytech University in Pomona, and gender studies at the Graduate University. So I wanted you here because I saw your book, The Bro Code. And one of the things that I have often thought is there's not enough said about how men are raised and how that creates the problems that we're experiencing today. And so I want you to first tell us about what, you are, what your work is who you are. I gave you this, I gave this introduction from Wikipedia, but I want to hear from you and what are your current projects? Sure. Uh, beyond the book that you mentioned, The Bro Code, that came out this spring, uh, my, my first book was Masculinities in Contemporary American Culture, which is used mainly as a textbook all around the world right now on issues of men and masculinities. I have released four films, three of them through Media Education Foundation, uh, Generation M, which was back in uh, 2008, and uh, the Bro Code film, 2011, and then the Empathy Gap, Masculinity and the Courage to Change, which was a film basically inspired by the work of Bell Hooks. Uh, and my latest film last year was uh, Bullied, about the phenomenon of bullying uh, here in the United States and around the country. My new film is coming out next month. Very excited about that. It is entitled, How Does It Feel to Be a Problem? Which is, of course, the famous question by W.E.B. Du Bois in his book, The Souls of Black Folk. And that's coming out next month. So that's sort of a rundown of some of the, the things I've been publishing and releasing and thinking about and, and working on. Here, okay. because this you are obviously very well versed in maleness, shall I call it that, masculinity, and also aware, have an awareness of race and social justice. I mean, the fact that you're even citing Bell Hooks and W.B. Du Bois in your intro speaks volumes to me. Okay, so my first question is, you're addressing men. Wh who do you mean by men? What Men come in all kinds of sizes, shapes, races, economic uh, uh, backgrounds, and so forth. Oh, you're uh, absolutely yeah, Wait right. a minute. This is Pride Month, and I also need to <laughs> add and gender identities and sexual orientations, all of that. So when you talk absolutely. about men, who you're talking about. Absolutely. And that's why my first book was pluralized. It's masculinities, plural, uh -huh. in contemporary American culture, there are intersectional identities when we're talking about issues of masculinity. As you mentioned, you know, we do have race, ethnicity, we have a socioeconomic background, we have gender identity, we have sexual orientation, and these identities play a role in the way that some boys are raised to be men, uh, what they think are the norms of, of masculine culture, uh, the way that we're taught to think about girls and women, for instance, the way that we view one another and how we treat one another. So all of those identities are extremely important in talking about this, this kind of category of masculinities. It's not a one size fits all, you know, exegesis of masculinity. There, there's so many different ways to look at this and those different identities need to be respected and evaluated on their own terms. Okay, cool. So just give us one example of a difference in a masculine, in different masculinities, just one example. Well, I mean, there, there are some obvious ones like wealth privilege. 
if someone is born into wealth, the way they view what is normal for them might be very different than those people who are not born into wealth. I'll give you an example because I was just interviewing a professor at USC just two days ago, and she was talking about voter suppression in America and how some people can't even conceive of the idea of someone not having a photo ID. It's inconceivable to them, right? Because their norm is, well, everyone has a, whether a driver's license or something that they can use because they're flying planes and they're, they're driving cars, but that's not true. There are a, a significant number of people that don't have a photo ID. Many of them are Native Americans. They live in reservations. Many of them are living in poverty. And so when we're talking about differences, how are people viewing the world? What is their normal, right? right. Because normal is, is socially constructed, but it's also constructed through your economic backgrounds, your cultural backgrounds, and, and that can separate people in the way they view things as being normal, right, wrong, et cetera. What's the common denominator of men? See, the book, The Bro Code is, is named The Bro Code because I think there is a common denominator among a lot of men. I don't want to overgeneralize it, but I think that we can generalize it to some extent. And that is that too many boys, not just in America, but all around the world, are raised to view girls and women as less important, as mainly objectified beings, as beings that are subordinate or should be subordinate to men. And the statistics on this tell the story, whether we're talking about injury to women, whether we're talking about uh, workplace inequalities, whether we're talking about harassment and the Me Too movement, uh, when I ask audiences, what do you think the number one cause of injury to men in the world is? And they throw out, you know, a number of different guesses. And I say, the answer is car accidents are the number one ways that men uh, suffer an injury of some kind. Then I ask, what do you think the number one cause of injury to women all around the world is? And they throw out some guesses. And the answer is intimate partner violence. Yeah, I knew that. It is domestic violence. And that means that issues of violence against women is ultimately a men's issue. Because when we talk about men, I'm sorry, when we talk about violence against women, what we should always say is men's violence against women. Because <laughs> overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, it is men who are perpetrating this violence. And so that means we have to rethink fundamentally the way we are raising our boys to think about girls and young men to think about women. And that's going to take a lot of men stepping up and modeling it and talking about it and correcting young guys to say, no, we can't talk about girls and women that way. We have to respect their autonomy. We have to respect their personhood. And that, that's, that sounds to me like it couldn't be more of a platitude. Who could be against that? But I do get a lot of pushback. I get quite a bit of pushback when you talk about treating girls and women with the same equality, respect, and autonomy as men. Pushback from whom? What do they say? Pushback comes overwhelmingly from men. That shouldn't be surprising. And I, I have also found, since I've been doing this work a long time, and I speak around this country to groups every year, the pushback comes from men primarily, and primarily white men. And their pushback is that I'm trying to, and others like me, are trying to blur gender. So we have a genderless world, and women and men are the same, and we don't respect differences, and that men are good at some things and women at other, all of this sort of thing, that they think there are fundamental differences. This is called gender essentialism for your audience. Right. They think that men are essentially one way. Women are essentially different. And, and that we have to respect those differences. Um, so that's the beginning of the pushback. That's the beginning of the pushback. But it gets a lot more sinister than that. You have men that will say, especially after the Me Too movement, they'll say, well, a lot of women are just making this stuff up, you know, or they're exaggerating or they're angry at, at some relationship problem that they're having. And so they're falsely accusing men of these things. 
that kind of pushback, which by the way, is the history of, of the world as men not believing women. When women say, you know, that this happened, I had an incident or, you know, a sexual harassment or assault. What's the, what's the first thing a defense attorney does in a court of law? Well, she's making it up. It's a lie. And this is where a lot of men, and by the way, these groups have names, so I'd like to name them. These are men's rights activists. They're a very powerful lobby in America. They tend to be politically conservative. They're made up overwhelmingly of men. And they believe that men are under attack today. Not women, but men are under attack through false allegations and false accusations. And they're angry. And they think that we need to restore traditional manhood to America. And they think that that's where everything is going wrong. And that people like me are the ambassadors of messing everything up by trying to talk about equality. Okay, so is there an overlap? Because everything you just said about uh, restore malehood is equivalent to restore white people as dominant forces in this country and that there is a biological essential difference between the races and one race was meant to rule. Is there overlap between the those two groups of people. Absolutely. <laughs> you hit it right on the head. You have lots of white people, I think, as your audience understands, that feel the very same way, that white people are under attack, they're losing their power, you know, with the ascension of people of color. And not just people of color, but women of color, who we don't talk about nearly as much. Or, as we talked about before, LGBT communities and how people from various diverse backgrounds are beginning to slowly ascend. And, and white people, this is why the slogan was make America great again, because they think there's some mythical point in the past when things were great. And, and the truth of the matter is, and I'm sure your audience would agree, the further you go back in the past, the less equality there is. You got that right. <laughs> so, if you want to pick the 1950s or 1930s or whatever you think is that mythical time when America was great, it was not great for millions and millions of people, uh, people who had to live through Jim Crow segregationism, gay people who had to live in the closet out of fear for their lives. Women were not allowed to go to college in many cases. The Ivy League schools didn't even allow women until the 1970s for the most part. So the further back you go into time, the more inequality there is. And if that's what they are heralding as the, the great times of America, well, then what they're heralding is a time of great inequality. Uh, when white, especially white men, more than any other group, had a stranglehold on the power of America. And they see their power today in 2021 as being in jeopardy. And that's what they're angry about. And men are a part of that overlap, which you were talking about, the overlap there. Right. When you look at who voted for Donald Trump, everyone knows, look at any poll out there. It was overwhelmingly white people. But when you go inside the numbers, it was more men than women. It was overwhelmingly white men. And that's the group that is angry the most, I would say, in America today. And, and the ones that are causing the most havoc when you're looking at domestic terrorism. And this is, this is documented by the, the Department of Justice, by the CDC. These aren't feminist websites. And they're saying the vast majority of the anger that has been provoking the insurgency in ja on January 6th. The cameras tell the story. It's yes, overwhelmingly white men that rushed the Capitol building with Confederate flags yelling and screaming, and, and, and people's lives were lost. So this is fascinating. But yes, there, there's a strong overlap between what you were talking about and masculinity. They go together. So this is fascinating. What in the world? So now I'm looking at you saying, where did this man come from? Okay, so how did you grow up? How did you grow up? And how did you get interested and aware of this topic? How did this even happen? You know, it's a good question. It's a question I always get because honestly, a lot of men, particularly white men, are not interested in these topics. So it's an excellent question. You know, 
things happen over a person's life. I, I'm, I'm a believer that if you want to change, you want to improve and become a better person, you can. And a number of things happened in my own life. First and foremost, I became a dad. And wait, I know wait, back, that, wait, let's go way back before you became a dad. Oh, let's before I was a dad. Childhood. Uh, I wouldn't say that there was anything about my childhood that was progressive at all. My family were very conservative, Southern Baptist, white. And so the or I was raised around racist thinking, sexist thinking, homophobic, all of that. That was just how I was raised. Now, I have to say, even by the time I became a teenager, a lot of that didn't connect with me. My friends, I was in a neighborhood that was a diverse neighborhood. My school, schools that I went to were diverse. And so that old fashioned segregation way of thinking really didn't connect with me even when I was young. But I was raised in a very conservative, uh, hyper religious background. So it was later in my life, maybe my 20s, where I really started to question you know, the, the things that were told to me as a boy and as a young man. Was there a light bulb moment? I think there were light bulb moments, plural. I played baseball for Long Beach State here in Southern California. And sports culture, and a lot of folks who played in sports know this, can be very toxic. Uh, it was toxic in terms of its homophobia. It was toxic in terms of its sexism and misogyny. And so my late teens, early 20s in sports culture was not a time when I was very progressive at all. The light bulbs were not really coming on. I'm in locker room environments where other guys my age and my coaches who were older than me would say things that were horribly misogynistic or homophobic. And we went along, you know, we went along with that. They became the templates for our behavior. We so talk we, about in our diversity training, we sometimes talk about the locker room culture as the beginning of what we now experiencing today. Absolutely. Absolutely. My coaches, who we looked up to as father figures when I was young, uh, were the ones that were modeling some of this really dysfunctional behavior. And so they validated those behaviors to us. And we did that. I, I'm sure when I was uh, 19, 20, 21, I was saying things that were completely inappropriate and, and my thinking was not where it is today by any means, because that's what I was surrounded with. It wasn't until I got older, I started getting an education. I began reading books by people like Bell Hooks, who's been, I think, of, of authors out there. She's one of the most important authors in my life. When she wrote, when she wrote her book about masculinity, The Will to Change, if anyone has not read that, I recommend it highly. It was illuminating to me. That book was just like a wow moment for me. Because not only did Bell Hooks break down some issues that I think a lot of men can relate to, and women too, she did it with compassion. She did it with compassion, which is surprising. If anyone knows uh, Bell Hooks' background, she was abused. And so she has every right to be angry. But that book is filled with this compassion this loving attitude toward gender and, and men. And it opened the door for me. It, it taught me so many other ways so that in my own work, when I go out to young men now and I, they're looking at me and they're sitting in the audience, I temper my talks as much as I can consciously in a loving way, in a compassionate way, because that, that, that opens the door instead of coming at them in an angry way which right. causes them to a lot of times shut the door. People have to feel accepted to want to change. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. and that's the irony of it, because we, we, we want to reject we want to reject them for what we want to see change, but that doesn't work. Doesn't work. And I, I get angry because another light bulb moment for me, my students. I've been teaching gender studies now for over 15 years. And the testimonies my students have shared with me things that have happened to them. Mind blowing. I mean, things that I couldn't even imagine, mainly with women, but also uh, young LGBT students as well. Horrible things, and they anger me. And say, so- Say more about that. This is Pride Month. So say, give right. an example. 
I, you know, I'm here in Southern California and a lot of my students are LGB and T as well. I have trans students and what they have had to go through sometimes in their own families, being rejected by their own families, disowned, thrown out onto the streets, horrible things. Um, or within their culture or their neighborhoods where they had actually been physically assaulted by people in their neighborhoods. And so they have uh, been suicidal sometimes. Yeah. They, they're yeah. open about yeah. that. They sometimes were bullied all the way down into middle school and high school routinely by classmates and, and, and others. So their whole life has been one challenge after another with people you know, uh, harming them physically, verbally, psychologically. And yet what, what inspires me is how many of them to, to this day are, are, are strong, powerful allies now. They become voices and activists instead of just withdrawing, which, you know, I can't imagine what they've gone through. Instead of that, they become activists. And now they want to work with other young people and help those people come through the, the storm. Okay, so as concretely as you can, talk about the change of attitude that you yourself have gone through, you've witnessed your students gone through. What does it take? You know, this is the question that everybody's asking. What does it take to get men to see the harm and, and devastation they're, they're bringing not only to others, but to themselves, how they stifle them, their own growth and their own sense of well-being. What, what, talk about the change. That is the million dollar question. You nailed it. And here's what I have learned. There are a couple things that cause men to start reflecting and, and taking seriously the things that we're talking about. One of those things I want to be Wait, ahead, before you say anything, I want to emphasize, you said to start reflecting. So you're saying the first step is reflection. Yeah, I think so. It, it, and being honest, we have to be honest with ourselves. And that, that's kind of a first step with lots of change. Lots of change starts with self-honesty. So you're honest with yourself. You, you begin to reflect on your life. The first group of men that are, are usually start to that change is, is one of the things that started me on that change, which was parenthood. Those men who become parents, and I want to be clear, this doesn't happen for all men. This isn't some universal light bulb that comes on that they have a son or a daughter and they change. Lots of people don't change. But for a lot of the men that I have met that have really started rethinking the way they were, uh, they became parents and they had a son or a daughter or both. And they started looking around the world and saying, is this the world I want my child to be raised in? And when their answer was no, it's kind of scary. Um, that's when they started thinking, you know, we, we need to make some change. And maybe part of that change is me, that I have to start thinking differently about the way I see, you know, women, girls, uh, if they're white, people of color, if they're heterosexual, how I look at, you know, LGBT individuals. And so that's where some of the journey started. Here's my second answer. This one's probably less inspirational to your audience, but I have found this to be what works. And that is appealing to self-interest. You have to tell men how change benefits their lives. Right now, as we were talking earlier about white people feeling like maybe their power is being challenged right now, right. that's how a lot of men are feeling that their power is being challenged right now by people like me. And so you have to reframe that so they understand, no, no, no. What we're trying to do is help people's lives. And this helps men's lives, just as you mentioned, just as much. And so you have to appeal to self-interest and show them that a different life is a better life for them. So break that down. What, what is it, what do men have to do? I'm going to be real callous here. What do men have to do? What's the advantage of them giving up power? Yep. I love the question. And I've been asked it so many times. I am ready. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I knew you were. <laughs> 
one of the things I like to say early on when I'm giving a talk somewhere is that nothing that I'm saying is male bashing. I'm not here to bash men. All right. In fact, if I really wanted to bash men, if I really want to say something toxic to men, I would start with this. Don't do anything. Keep everything exactly as it is. Don't change at all. That's the most toxic thing I can tell men. Why? The numbers speak for themselves, folks. Buckle your seatbelt. Here we go. Look at incarceration rates. Men are incarcerated 11 times more than women. Look at suicide rates. Men commit suicide at four times the rate of women. Whoa, I didn't know that. And in some regions, that's over 10 times. All right. right. Nationally, it's four times. And this is the CDC. This is the National Institute of Health. Look at, especially if they've been in military service, the suicide rates for men who've been in military service are off the charts. Mm. And part of the reason for this, and I've spoken to lots of military personnel, is that when a man goes into the military, women too, but especially men, they are taught you don't reach out for help. If you've got a problem, you fix it. You fix it on your own, you take charge, and you don't ask others for help. That that's, that that's a feminine thing to do, that, that women can ask for help, but not men, that you're supposed to be a man and man up and, and be tough. And that's killing us, literally killing us, that guys are taught that they can't emote, that they can't have the human emotions of fear, of anxiety, of loneliness, of self-doubt, that we have to constantly put on this front it, which is it's like an armor that we put on ourselves that we're tough and invulnerable and, and are, you know, unafraid of anything. And it's killing us. We're developing heart disease at greater rates, always have. We die earlier than most women, statistically. Right. And when you put in the crime rates and the statistics of incarceration, who wants that? Nobody wants that for themselves, nor do they want it for their sons. Nobody wants to think that I'm going to raise some boys who might be trotting off to prison someday for some misdeeds. Nobody wants that. So, so how I, do you connect the culture to, to the culture to the outcome that you're talking about? All of those uh, disastrous outcomes. The culture itself is toxic because we teach men that to be a man is not just to be tough and strong and invulnerable. And when it comes to your family, you're supposed to be a provider and protector, overwhelmingly. But you are also taught that behind this toughness, you can't do anything or feel anything or, or behave in any way that could be considered feminine. And so what they're doing, what our culture does, is it takes human traits like empathy, love, compassion, generosity, and we call those things feminine. And then we call other things like ambition, uh, competition, strength, and all, we call those things masculine. So we're literally from the time we are little boys being taught never be feminine, never do anything that's considered feminine, and always do these things that are masculine. The culture is teaching us this. Then the next thing we teach boys when they get a little bit older is to be a man is to be successful. And we're talking about money in a capitalist society like America. You were taught a successful man is a man with resources. Why, why is, why do people love Trump? The people that love Trump, they, they, they may have, right, they may have a number of things they say, but listen to what, one of the things you'll always hear from a Trump supporter when, when the rubber hits the road and you want to say, what do you like about this guy? And the, one of the things they'll say is, look how rich he is. Look how successful he's been. That somehow the fact that he's made all this money, or at least he inherited it, and so that he's made all this money is a measurement of his manhood, a measurement of his masculine strength. We are told, this, boys are taught this from the time we are young, that we should strive that women are commodities, that money is something that we should have and we should show that in lots of ways with our fancy cars and, you know, the way we talk. 
And so all of this is culture driven. This is driven. And, and by the way, I want to say that that particular point I'm making now is something that transcends race and ethnicity. Right. You find this throughout different you know, cultures. It's not just white masculinity we're talking about here that are taught that being successful, having lots of, of women at your disposal, having money so you can have fast cars. That's been taught to boys forever. There's nothing new about any of this. And it, tran it transcends race and ethnicity. So yes, American culture itself, and you find this around the world too, so I don't want to just say this is an American phenomenon. It's certainly not. But American culture in particular is a pressure cooker to men to conform to hyper-capitalistic, hyper-sexist women as commodities message. Okay, so if I grew up thinking that I'm not supposed to uh, feel anything. And I, th and I think feelings of danger are dangerous. Why on earth would I want to do that? What would be the advantage to me for doing that? You know, a lot of times boys are taught, and I, I'm not saying that, by the way, that no girls act like this. I don't want to make it sound like- we're not, know, Yeah, we're not- these we're talking about trends. I'm I'm a, a I'm a trained researcher. We're talking about statistical trends, and so right. we might use generalized language. I'm, I'm just giving my disclaimer speech. We might use a generalized language, but we're not talking about everybody. And everyone will know has a cousin Joe who's an exception. It, okay. it, it, it's like Denzel Washington says in one of his movies, Training Day. It's not what you did; it's what can be proven. And so a lot of men are taught, you can cross lines, right? Whether it's stealing, whether it's taking advantage of a, a woman who might be intoxicated, you can cross lines as long as you don't get caught. Oh my word. And I think how heard many, that before. Think how many celebrities in our culture are living proof of that. That only till very recently, very recently, have high profile male celebrities been held accountable for their misdeeds? It, like the Harvey Weinsteins of the world or, or, or the Bill Cosby's. It's a very, very new phenomenon. In the past, boys have thought, well, who's gonna know? And let me tell you something else. I wanna connect the dots to college culture, to any of you in college or your, your college teachers. This is a big part of frat culture as well, fraternity right. around America. Why do you think they pledge a fraternity What's the pledging part? The pledging is that you're swearing that whatever happens in this house stays in this house. The worst thing a bro can do is rat out another bro. So notice it's not don't do bad things. It's don't get caught and don't rat out anyone that you know did something bad. That's a huge part of male culture. Never oh. tell so, so if I'm raised not to feel, if I'm raised not to, I won't say even say me, if John, no, I'm going to say me because I think like that. If I'm raised not to feel, I'm raised I have to be tough, I'm raised I have to be successful, and I'm raised that I can do anything I want as long as I don't get caught, then I'm setting myself up to go to prison. I'm setting myself up to. It is. To, for bankruptcy. I'm setting myself up for all the things that you were saying that men die from. Absolutely. And that's oh, why my goodness. I, I had never connected the dots like that before. Dig this. There's a professor at the University of Nebraska. Her name, her name is escaping me, but it'll come to me if I don't think about it. She did research on men and women who have been incarcerated for violent crimes. Her research team went to prisons around the country and, and asked, just asked the questions, you know, explain what happened that, that got you in this situation, right? And here's what they learned, that when you talk to the majority of women who've been incarcerated, and again, these are for violent crimes now, they will quickly take blame for mistakes they made. They will say something about, I did this and I did that and, and you know, when you ask men who did very similar crimes the same question, they deflect blame externally. They don't take it. Someone did this. He made me do that. 
she made me do this. They take the blame and they externalize it. And that's how we're taught as boys. You don't, you aren't culpable, find others. They're the problem. They're the reason that you lashed out and hit that person or did something violently. It wasn't your fault. So the don't get caught, connect the dots between a don't get caught ideology and uh, someone and and I can't, don't get caught and someone else made me do it. What's What's the connection there? Don't get caught. But if you do... <laughs> Blame someone else. <laughs> You're not culpable. It's someone else's fault. Well, the way she spoke to you was disrespectful, or she said something that crossed a line. He looked at me in a disrespectful way, you know. He had no business getting into my personal space. Things like that. Crazy stuff. And those of you who are guys watching this show, you were raised in largely the same culture I was. You know exactly what I'm talking about. That it can go from zero to 60 really quick with guys because he was looking at me, you know, you know in a disrespectful way. And we, what? And suddenly that turns into some physical confrontation. I go to a gym and I see this. I see it happen at my gym. Or what are you looking at? And before you know it, there's something happened in the gym. You're going, what was going on there? You don't see women behaving like this, or at least you don't as much. It's rare. But you see guys, any of you that have experienced road rage, right? Some guys you know, revving his car and flipping you off. Take a look at the gender as they're going by. It's overwhelmingly likely. Do you know that according to the Department of Justice, 90% of road rage is men. 90% of road rage is men. And that doesn't surprise anybody. You know, when I say these things in public, you know what people will say? And this is a horrible thing. They'll say, well, boys will be boys. That's the way men are. Yeah, that's it. As though somehow it's endemic. It's like in us. It's built into our neurology. Snakes and snails and puppy dog tails. And that's it. There's nothing we can do about it. Guys Guys will be guys. And I will say to them, that's male bashing. That's really bad male bashing. And there is no science to back that up. The first Two chapters of my book are devoted to the biology of violence. And they've oh, been really and they have been looking, researchers for 70 years have been looking at testosterone. They've been looking at different sections of the brain, neurology, they've been looking at genetics to try to find out is there something in the way men are wired that causes men to be more aggressive, more hostile, more violent. And to date, they failed, whether it was double Y chromosomes, whether it was the, the A, o, uh, A uh, allele and, and um, it, it, this, this enzyme producing, whether it was uh, sections of the brain they said were more you know, geared toward hostility. None of it has panned out. But you still, that's the go-to. Well, boys will be boys. There's really nothing we can do about it, you know? And if they're right, what a terrible indictment. If they're right, that there's nothing we can do about it, then brace yourself for more wars and build more prisons because there's just nothing we can do about it. Now, if there is something we can do about it, which is let's raise our boys differently to be more empathic, to care and show love, and that there's nothing wrong with that that doesn't threaten your manhood in some way to be a sensitive and a compassionate human being, maybe we start to see difference. And there's a lot of research to back that up. There's a lot of research that the way one is raised has an impact on the way they behave. Yes. So I'm, all I'm thinking of is men don't ask for directions. And if, and that's part of the not seeking help, I'm sure. That's right. So if... You can't even get men to go to the doctor. <laughs> I swear, my, my own doctor says to me, that a lot of his patients, when, when it's time for them to have uh, the digital exam for prostate cancer, they'll refuse. They'll just refuse. You know, that I'm not having that. Nope, nope, nope. It, this is, so this is what I mean when I said earlier that we're literally dying from this. Prostate cancer is one of the leading causes of death in men. All of you know that. But there are millions of men who won't even get tested. They won't even get tested because of the homophobic connotation of their male doctor perhaps having to touch them you know and so they won't get they won't do it and I, I say to them we're doing things that are killing us literally that we can change just like that 
Okay, so you said appeal to their self-interest. You've laid out the case for what the self-interest is. I'm talking to Joe Blow, who doesn't want a digital exam and won't ask for directions. What's the self-interest? What would I even say to that person? I will first of all say that's a tough sell. Grab Joe Blow off the street. It might not go well. He might just not. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. Okay, so, you know, so, it's so, not so who, who, who would listen? Pick, pick, describe the person who's ready yeah. and right for the right appeal. First of all, I, I teach, and I should say I speak a lot at university campuses. And so that's a rarefied environment. And I'm, I'm aware of that. So my audiences... A lot of them have education or their students there. So they're already reading things. They're already maybe immersed in some of these conversations. So they're already kind of halfway there, you know, and that's not a hard sell. The, the folks in the military that I spoke of before, a whole bunch of them came up to me in their, in their uniforms. They had the camouflage gear after one of my talks. And I didn't know what was going to happen, whether this was going to be good or bad. And some of them hugged me low and said, we've lost our brothers in arms to suicide. We have friends of ours that have died. Right. And instead of us seeking help, we self-medicate with alcohol and drugs because we're taught never to reach out for help. So they've already witnessed friends of theirs or family members die. They've already had that experience. And so they're ready for these conversations. Ah, so part of connect part of it then is helping them identify those they care about who have literally suffered or died from this. That has been toxicity. Absolutely. That's one of the things I've noticed. I mean, I tried this once. I was speaking in New York and um, I tried this tactic and I don't use this tactic anymore. But I said, a lot of you young guys out there are going to be fathers someday, maybe sooner than, you know, later. And you would hope that if your daughter was going to college someday and she was at a fraternity party and maybe she had been drinking too much, that the young men there are going to do the right thing and not the wrong thing, that they're going to make sure that she's safe and no one's going to take advantage of that circumstance. And so you have a vested interest in thinking about how men behave. And I know this is horrible, but I'm going to tell you what a guy in the back of the auditorium yelled. And this is my challenge. It haunts me to this day yells from the back of the auditorium she's not my daughter bro uh. and so and i'm stunned and the audience groaned and i'm just I, I was in silence for several seconds and when the audience died down i said you know that's one of the scariest things i've ever heard someone say i i said i expect i i don't know because i'm not a psychologist but i expect that's the sort of thing a sociopath might say that has no interest in, in anyone else's welfare, but their own. It's a terribly sad, scary thought that there are men who think like that. How to get through to them, I don't know. I don't know. So, so talk about the polarization going on now. Okay. I, the people who are going to be listening to this are people who are dedicated to racial and social justice. And uh, everyone I know who's participating is horrified by what's happening now. Do you have hope? I have lots of hope. Well, I'm tell us. Very optimistic. And people sometimes go, really? Based on what? <laughs> and look, my generation, I don't know. I don't know. My hope comes from all of the young people that I meet all around this country. And I speak everywhere, including red states. And young people are not my generation by any means. They are far more progressive in their thinking. They are far more accepting. They are diverse and they're interested in diversity. Look, it's not that you won't find young people who wear the Make America Great hat, and they, they bought into that message. But I have to tell you, when it comes to young people, they are in the minority. The majority of people around this country, when you're talking about young folks, they think differently. They want a diverse and pluralistic world. They want a world where people are accepted. They are overwhelmingly accepting of LGBT. 
they're overwhelmingly accepted of women's rights and women's equality. So the dinosaurs who want to take us back to the 1950s are, first of all, a lot of them are older, but even the ones who are younger, they are small in numbers compared to the majority. So I get my optimism from a lot of young people. Yes. The news, the people who make the news are not the young people you're talking about. Nope. And I speak in red states. I've, I've spoken in Texas and Kentucky and lots of other places where they will tell me now you're not in California anymore. And I go, I understand that. I appreciate that. But those young people as well are talking in terms of diversity and plurality. And, and I've even had coaches bring their entire basketball and football teams to my talks. So there's a bunch of guys sitting wow. in the University, really? University of Connecticut. The coach brought his entire basketball team and they were right in the middle of the conversations raising their hands and making points and part of the dialogue so i think our future is bright we still have challenges you know we all know that i don't have to sell anybody on that we we have a lot of polarization we have a lot of challenges that we have to meet um, but at the same time i am optimistic because the young people in this country make me optimistic uh, I'm so emboldened by, by their messages, by their desire to, to change and make the world a better place. I, I'm just so inspired by young people. So that's where my optimism is from. Wonderful. Okay, so my last question. I, 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 that listening to you, I have to say, just filled me. All of a sudden, I felt a surge of hope. Okay, and I, I, I'm an optimistic person, but every now and then I just sink down, sink down, sink down. So I, I need infusions like you just gave. Okay, my last question to you. Speak to the women, the women who are raising sons, the women, and I know a bunch of them, the women who says, everything is fine. I love my partner. He's wonderful, except and the women who are estranged from their fathers. I know people in all three categories who are wondering what to do. This is probably the most difficult question for me to field. I have seen my work overwhelmingly directed toward boys and men. Many of, the, many of my friends who are women are feminists and they will say things to me like, your work is primarily with boys and men that our work as feminists are with girls and women. It's not that, you know, I don't, I mean, we overlap, we're, we're human beings, we're partners. Um, I don't usually give women advice though, in terms of, you know, what they should do, or I don't think men should be policing women's choices at all, really. But I understand if, if a woman, you have sons and you're thinking, I don't want my sons to grow up like these guys that you're describing, that are on the way to a criminal justice record and all of that. Absolutely, I think every parent can, can relate to that. And trying to get your boys, and this takes mom, dad, but if, if there's just mom or there's just dad, that's cool too. Try to get your boys to understand why it's important that we treat girls with the same equality, dignity, autonomy, as, as ourselves from the earliest ages, they have to get that message and then reinforce. And then as men and women, we have to model that. We have to model, we can't just say it. We've got it. We've got to act it. When okay. we're around boys and I'm a coach or I'm a dad or I'm a Sunday school teacher or whatever I am, I've got to model this in the way I'm speaking and the way I'm behaving. So they're looking at me when I walk into a classroom and I understand I'm a university professor, but this applies if you're a second grade teacher, right. you walk into the classroom, all eyes are on you. They are checking you out. The things you say, the way you conduct yourself is on display. And they're going to they're gonna consume that. So I would say to moms and dads, we've got to model it all the time. We need more dads, though. We really need more dads to step up and go, absolutely, and be on board with this. So we're both doing it. Okay, partners. Partners. That's right. Ask any so young. I'm saying, to what do you what do you say to women who say my partner is great except he is stuck. He won't get help. I can't get him to go to the doctor. He trashes uh, uh, people who are not like him, and I love him. Yeah, those are big things. Too. <laughs> those are, 
these aren't little adjustment moments. Those are big things. So if someone feels that way, I mean, that's something that they, first of all, should impress upon their partner, the man here, that, that they feel serious and strongly about. They have to make sure that, that their views and feelings are not simply dismissed. Uh, ah. a man who, uh, men who feel like, uh, I'm good the way I am. I don't need any help. And then if someone comes to them and says, you know, I don't like this or that and the way you say these things and this bothers me, they might not be in a frame of mind to even hear that, you know, in a constructive way and they'll just shut down on that. So, I, I mean, my recommendation to anyone is with your partner, whomever that is, is if you've got something serious that's bothering you, you love the person and you can, I would start the conversation out with, I love you very much. But there are things that really bother me and I'd like to have a frank and honest conversation with you about and hope that they respect that and they, they should they should respect it. You would hope so. But that's that's the best I can say. And it's not just to any partner that's having a problem in their relationship. It starts from love. I can't think of the scholar who said this that and, and Eddie Moore Jr., if you know who Eddie is, he's from the White Privilege Conference. He says, um, I, my first step is always with love. Whoa. That's my first step. Okay. Yeah. That's a perfect ending. <laughs> so I thank you so much for this interview. It's been very, this conversation, I should say, it's been very informative. I'm still going to st think hard about what you said about the not connecting the dots, which I had never done before, between not asking for help and how uh, and being raised to not also not be wrong. So that's fascinating to me. So uh, I encourage everyone, say how they can find you, say the name of your book that's coming out again. Uh, the, the book is called The Bro Code. And um, it's, uh, it's, can be purchased anywhere now. It's all, all over the markets. Uh, just my name, Thomas Keith. Uh, you can also go to my website, which is tomkeith.com, tomkeith.com. Uh, and that, all that information is there, as well as my films or any, anything else. They can also, my, my email address is right there if they want to write to me. That's cool too. Okay. And that's Keith spelled K-E-I-T-H. Right. Just like the first name. All right. So thank you very much. And it's been delightful. Wonderful, Jean. Thank you very, very much. I'm still reflecting on this conversation with Dr. Thomas Keith. He put together aspects of the toxic male culture that I hadn't put together in exactly that way. Now, for those of you who want to jump and say, well, uh, not all men are like that, we know that. We're talking about a cultural norm, a statistical trend that he says is all over the world. We're not just talking about, we're not claiming that all men fit into the mold that he cast, but the mold that he cast is worth talking about and worth noting. So here are the elements. Be strong, be tough, don't be vulnerable, be ambitious, be on top, women are inferior, treat women as inferior. If you're white male, treat people of color as inferior. Take risks, push boundaries, be ambitious, be successful, and do what it takes to be successful. It's okay to push boundaries and to do what you want as long as you don't get caught. And to avoid getting caught, blame somebody else. Even if you're responsible, blame someone else. The toxic male culture not only contributes to the hurt that goes to women, which I don't, but it feeds into the men putting their own physical selves at risk, both mentally, spiritually, and emotionally. So... For us who are women, he didn't want to give advice. He said, basically, the way you're going to change men or encourage men to change themselves is through love. I know, and I said it in the interview, that people don't change unless they feel loved. If we want them to change, then we have to change ourselves 
and be willing to love them anyway, to see the positive, positive side of them anyway, and to let them know we, have, we believe they have the capability to be better.